Welcome to section 16.5. Gentle people, this is the last section of chapter 16 that I'm going to cover and that you guys are responsible for. So gentle people, in this lecture, we're going to be discussing alloys. Now, an alloy is a mixture of two different metallic compounds. So this mixture is going to be a homogeneous mixture. In general, the best type of alloys are formed when the electronegativity of our metals are about the same. There are two major classes of alloys, substitutional and interstitial alloys. Let's talk about the first one, substitutional alloys. In this, what you're going to do is you're going to take the lattice and replace one element for another. So a very common substitutional alloy is brass. What happens in brass is you are going to get this array of copper atoms. So that's represented by these green spheres right here. And so in this lattice of copper atoms, you're going to make a substitution. You're going to replace some of these copper atoms for zinc atoms. If you do this in a one to three ratio of zinc to copper, what you end up with is brass. Another type of substitutional alloy is bronze. And in bronze, we replace 12% of the copper atoms with tin atoms. Now, another way to make an alloy is the interstitial method. And in an interstitial method, what you're going to do is you are going to put the incoming atom in the gaps or the holes created by your main element. So a good example of this is steel. What you have in steel is you have an array of iron atoms. Here the iron atoms are represented in green. And what you're going to do is in between the lattice of these green atoms, you're going to place another atom. And in this case for steel, what we do is we put carbon atoms in the gaps. So what they do with steel is they heat the iron real hot so that the iron lattice expands, they introduce the carbon, and then they cool the metal down. You, you might have seen a blacksmith quench a steel ingot, and the reason they quench it is they make that lattice contract and so the carbon gets stuck in between the iron lattice. Now, before I talk about the next type of alloys or mixtures, I want to go into what's called band theory. Now, band theory is going to play off the electronic structure of metal compounds, particularly metals and semiconductors. Now, we are going to go back a little bit and talk about molecular orbital theory. All right, general people, let's do molecular orbital theory and let's start out with the sodium atom. So I'm going to take sodium and I'm just going to deal with its valence electrons. And it has a 3s orbital filled with one electron. Now what I can do is I can add another sodium. And what I can form is Na2. And so you guys know that I can do constructive interference, destructive interference, and what I get is this molecular orbital diagram for Na2. Now let's think about this. What would happen if I take Na2 and another Na2 and I get that same molecular orbital diagram and I go ahead and put these two Na2s together to make Na4. Now I'm going to do the same kind of process. I can bring these two orbitals together, constructive, destructive interference, and then I can put these two guys together on the bottom. And what I can do is I can fill up my electrons like so. Now what I can do now is I can take two Na4s and put those two Na4s together and then I can go ahead and get Na8. And I can do this over and over and over and over again. So a couple of things that I want you to take note and the consequence in doing this ad infinitum. So ladies and gentlemen, here's what I talked about on a slide. Here's just sodium, Na2, Na4, and then I'm gonna keep going and I'm gonna keep on adding Na's together. 
Now, what you guys will see is that you guys will see all the anti-bonding orbitals kind of be on the top as I go make them. And you'll see all the bonding orbitals be on the bottom of this structure. Now, what you'll notice is that when I start making these, you'll start to see that my orbitals get closer and closer and closer together. If I keep doing this, what's going to happen is all my orbitals are going to come up. And so instead of saying that I have discrete orbitals, I'm just going to say that there is a band of orbitals up on top that is anti-bonding. And I have a band of orbitals on the bottom, and I will consider this bonding. In this picture, what you will notice is my bonding orbitals are all filled with electrons. And this is the hallmark of band theory. What we're saying is that when we put a whole bunch of atoms together, all their atomic orbitals mix together. And instead of having discrete molecular orbitals, I will generate these two bands, the antibonding band and the bonding bo band. When I put trillions and trillions of sodiums together, that's what's going to happen. Now that anti-bonding band, what we're going to do is we're going to call that the conduction band. And the band with all the filled electrons that are considered bonding, we're going to call that the valence band. It turns out that the energies of these two bands and their relation to each other is very important with conductivity. So for conductivity to occur, what I need to have happen is I need to have mobile electrons. And that means electrons that can jump from one orbital to another within the band themselves. So let's take a look at an insulator. In an insulator, what you guys will notice is that there is a large difference between the conduction band and the valence band. And so remember, the valence band is always filled. And so if that's the case, all my electrons are in an orbital inside the valence band and they have nowhere to go. And so my electrons are not mobile. This explains the reason why insulators don't conduct electricity. But let's take a look at a conductor. If we were to look at the relationship of the conduction band and the valence band in a conductor, what you guys will see is that the energies of these two bands, well, they overlap. And remember, the conduction band is filled with a bunch of empty molecular orbitals. And since the valence band has all these electrons, what can happen is electrons in the valence band can move into these empty orbitals in the conduction bands. And because the conduction band is empty, that means these electrons are mobile. They can jump from one atom to the other through the conduction band itself. And so this is the reason why conductors can conduct electricity. My electrons are mobile. Now let's take a look at a semiconductor. Like its name says, it's not superconductive. It is only conductive under certain situations. If I were to look at the band model, what I would see is that the conduction band and valence band, there is a little bit of difference. There's an energy gap in between them. Now, remember, I want mobile electrons to make sure my substance is conductive. And so what I can do is I can try to get electrons from the valence band to my conduction band, and suddenly my semiconductor will not be an insulator, it will be a conductive material. Now, because the energy gap is so small, there's a couple of things that I can do. One thing is, if I add heat, well, my semiconductor is going to be suddenly become more conductive. If I were to introduce light, well, again, what can happen is I would promote electrons from the valence band to the conduction band, and now suddenly my electrons are mobile and I get conduction through there. Now, there's other ways to make semiconductors more conductive, and that is to go ahead and dope a semiconductive material. Doping means that I'm going to take a foreign atom and place it into my crystal lattice, 
And so in essence, I'm making a type of alloy with my semiconductor materials. Now there's two types of semiconductors that we can make. One is called the N-type and the other is called the P-type. So let's go ahead and look at an N-type semiconductor. Let's say my bulk material is silicon. Now, if I just had silicon, then my picture would look like this picture right here. My valence band and my conduction band, they do not overlap, but the energy gap between them is very small. Now, remember that the valence band is filled with electrons and my conduction band is empty. And I want to get some electrons into that empty conduction band. So let's go ahead and make an N-type semiconductor. So what I can do is I can take a crystal of silicon and I can go ahead and dope it with arsenic. Now the reason I dope it with arsenic is there is a disparity in the number of valence electrons. If I go ahead and look at silicon, silicon has four valence electrons. That means all it takes to fill my valence band is to have four electrons and my valence band is completely filled. So this is true for pure silicon. But if we look at arsenic, arsenic has five valence electrons. And so when I substitute out some of these silicons for arsenic, well, arsenic has the four to fill up that valence band, but then it has these excess electrons or these extra electrons. And these extra electrons are going to go ahead and reside in this special type of molecular orbital between the two bands. And so this is my dopant or me doping electrons inside it. Now, since I put extra electrons or extra negative, this is called an N-type semiconductor. Now, what's going to happen is these electrons are a lot closer to the conduction band, and it will only take a little bit of heat, a little bit of light, to where those electrons will pop up. Even room temperature will make this thing conductive, where those electrons go into the conduction band and become mobile electrons. So this is one way where I can increase the conductivity of my semiconductor. Now, I mentioned that there was another way to make a semiconductor. The other way that I can make a semiconductor is I can dope it with something with less electrons. So again, I'm gonna have silicon, and this time I'm gonna go ahead and dope it with gallium. Now, what you guys will notice is silicon has four valence electrons, and gallium only has three valence electrons. So if I had something that was pure silicon, well, my valence band would be filled with electrons because it takes four electrons to fill that valence band. But gallium has less electrons than silicon. So when I mix these two together, what happens is I don't have this filled. There is going to be empty orbitals on here. Now I want you to be careful because they call these empty orbitals holes. Now, this isn't the holes we talked about in the last lecture. These holes are electronic holes, and so it's better to think of these or not use the term holes, but instead say empty molecular orbitals. Now, if you guys think about this, if I have empty molecular orbitals, well, that means the electrons in this filled orbital can go ahead and jump into those empty spots. And now what that means is those electrons are mobile. And mobile electrons means I have conductivity. So in this case, the conduction happens not in the conduction band, but actually happens in the valence band. I get electrons moving back and forth. Now, this type of semiconductor, what I've done is I've added less electrons to my system. So in essence, I'm adding something to make my system more positive. And so this is called a P-type semiconductor.
Now there's multiple uses for semiconductors. One of the ones that I want you guys to know is, is where we can create something called the PN junction. So here's what your book is trying to explain. If I take a P type semiconductor and put it next to an N type semiconductor, what you get is a PN junction. Now remember this P type semiconductor has these empty molecular orbitals. The N-type semiconductor has extra electrons inside it. And so what can happen is that I can put a bias across this PN junction. So let's say we put the negative terminal of a battery on one end and the positive terminal on the other end. Well, this negative terminal is going to attract those empty orbitals. And then on the other side, the positive is going to attract all the electrons. And so what occurs is that electricity cannot pass if I set up my bias this way, meaning I put the positive end of the battery on the P-type semiconductor and the negative terminal to the battery on the N-type semiconductor. What you can see is that these, these mole empty molecular orbitals start to drift over to this side, and then the electrons will start to drift over to the other side. And so what I can say now is electrons are going to be moving through my PN junction. So this is conductive where this was not conductive. And so this is what a PN junction does. It only allows electricity to pass from one end to the other end, but it doesn't allow electricity to flow in the opposite direction. Now, this is important if you are dealing with alternating current and direct current. The electricity that you get out in your walls, well, that is an oscillating current going back and forth. The current that you use on your laptop or charging your cell phone or tablet, well, that is a battery and uses direct current. And so what you have to do is you have to turn that alternate current into direct current and one way to do that is through a rectifier, which makes use of a PN junction, making electricity flow in only one direction. All right, Chem1C, I hope that made sense, and remember to stay safe.